Hello everybody, Shelly Kitten here and I have a different kind of video today than what you're all used to um, because I'm doing an interview and I'm going to be honest, first interview I've ever really done so I'm probably going to suck at it but I'll try. You may know him mostly as the voice of Krillin in the Dragon Ball series like Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball Super, GT if you actually watch that but uh, he's done, he's mostly known for that and does many other voices on top. Uh, and he is Sonny Strait. Hello. Hi, how you doing? Um, I'm all right. <laughs> Just a <laughs> bit, I've never done an interview as I've said, so I don't know how bad this is going to turn out. Interview? Oh, so, we'll get, we'll get you through this okay. Just relax, breathe deep, take in a deep breath through the nose, out the mouth. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, I That's think I'm good. For this interview. Okay, um, I know I've already kind of introduced you, but just for everyone who's listening or watching this rather, who don't know, what is your name and what do you do? Well, my name is Sonny Strait. I am a comic book artist and an animation voice actor and director. I'm also a teacher. I've taught uh, acting classes in my own studio as well as um, the University of North Texas and the Denton Community Theater. Um, basically, I've been working in the arts since 1988. I was born that year. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I Your was. <laughs> life is my career. 14th of February, 1988. Baby Michelle existed. <laughs> yeah, I promise I'm not your father. It's been, it was years later. Before I <laughs> oh, don't worry. A lot of people at my home say my auntie's my mum because I'm more like her, and I look more <laughs> like her. <laughs> Oh uh, well, I might be your, I might be your dad then. Your your auntie was pretty hot. <laughs> you could um, you could be my spiritual dad. That's right. Yay! What made you want to do voice acting? Um, I was a, a theater actor. I did a lot of theater in the Dallas Fort Worth area, and um, Funimation moved to Texas and had open auditions for Dragon Ball Z, and I'd never done anything like that before. But a friend of mine. She was actually a friend of Chris Sabat's, and she auditioned, but she didn't get a part. But she, her name was Michelle as well. Um, but she said, uh, "Hey, you should probably audition for this because you're always doing the funny voices uh, and and all the character roles in the theater." So I thought, "Well, I'll give Jot it part." But I landed the role of Krillin, and I thought, "Well, this is cool. I'm on a cartoon, right?" But I didn't think it would last. I thought, "Eh, it's like two years. This is a fad." It'll go away in two years, and I'll have to, you know, go back to my day job, which is doing commercial artwork. And um, but I ended the part with Krillin. But when I got Krillin, um, uh, Cartoon Network heard what I did. Well, Tsunami, some of you have heard of that. It's a it's a phenomenon here um, where they have this robotic host who introduces the cartoons named Tsunami Tom. And they asked me to audition for Tsunami Tom. And then when I got Tsunami Tom, I realized I kind of stumbled onto a career here. So I put a lot more focus on it. And also, uh, within like two years, we started getting more shows. And so um, it became a viable career option here in the Dallas area. It was quite a lucky break for you at that point, considering that you were living near a big studio. <laughs> work on your artwork, work on your craft, because you never know when opportunity is going to knock on the door. But when it does, you've got to be ready. And there will be opportunities. There are always opportunities. You just have to be ready for them. I mean, before Funimation, I had all kinds of other opportunities, like in the comic theater field. So you just got to make sure that you put in the hours and get the experience and be ready for when it happens, you know? Oh, definitely. <laughs> I really, do. I really keep looking for things. I mean, like I say, I keep this channel going, and I'm about over thirty-two thousand subscribers now. Thanks, everybody, by the way. I mean, my I was very lucky that my first voice acting gig was, you know, something that was a professional paying gig. You know, um, nowadays there's so many options for voice acting. You know, them don't pay very well, but it's a good way to get your chops. You mm -hmm. know, um, and it was. For me, as a comic book artist, that was that was my experience because there were a lot of small comic book companies when I was starting out, and so like like my first professional gig, I think was 1989 or something, and it was a short story. It was a 10-page story. I think they paid us three dollars a page oh, wow. to do this, um, but it got us out there, and we were in print, and that was you know kind of all the boost that we needed. Um, but there were plenty of companies back then that would hire you, but you wouldn't get paid much. Oh. You couldn't live off of it. 
Yeah. Um, we made a lot more money when we started self-publishing our work. I want to say that me and my buddy Bill, who was writing uh, this book called Mr. Average, we published. I think we made 500 each on the first issue or something like that. But it was like, whoa, real money, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think the first gig I had that I actually could live off of um, was ElfQuest. Mm. And that happened after I was already a, a voice actor. But uh, they, I, I believe back then they paid me $75 a page. And I found, and I would do five pages a week, and I found I could live off of that barely because I was in LA, and LA is really expensive. Yeah. But luckily, while I was out there, I auditioned for a, an anime um, called I'm Going to Be an Angel. And it was actually directed by the, the Japanese director. She flew over to LA, and um, it was kind of cool. Uh, but also they, they gave me like four of the lead roles, which was strange for me because I'm from, you know, working at Funimation, mm. we've got so much in our talent pool that, you know, if you get a lead role, you're only going to get one. You're generally not going to get several. I mean, back in the early days, maybe, like in, when it was just 20 of us, but now we have a talent pool of like 600 people. Oh, wow. So it was weird, and I realized at that time that LA just, LA just didn't have any talent. They had a lot of pretty people, but they didn't have a lot of people who had talent. Mm. Um, that's changed quite a bit, though, because a lot of our Funimation people, a lot of people from New York, have also have moved out to LA uh, to do voice work. So now there's a big talent pool in, in LA as well. But back then, it was easy to get parts. It really was. Mm. Because there's more people now, it's a bit more challenging to win over parts that you'd like to there's get. More, there's more talented people attracted to that area. They're yeah. making more cartoons out there, you know, so they've got a bigger talent pool to draw from. Mm. But back then, it was so, and they would book me for like nine hours because their other actors were taking that long to record. Well, I would get done in three, but they would pay me for the nine hours. Yeah. And it was like, so it worked out really well. So, it, that helped me survive when I was in Los Angeles, is having that, that gig, as well as ElfQuest. Who was your biggest voice acting inspiration? I have to say it was Mel Blanc. Uh, he's the guy that created the voices for Bugs Bunny and Porky Pig and Daffy Duck, all those old Warner Brothers characters. Um, but back in the 70s, Hanna-Barbera put out a lot of crazy, wacky cartoons. And there were also a lot of smaller uh, companies that put out these really, I mean, Today, they would probably be uh, typical animation, but back then it was limited animation. Um, things like Tennessee Tuxedo and Super Chicken and George of the Jungle and things like that. I just, I really got a kick out of those funny voices. And my father uh, did impressions of funny, funny voices too. Like he would, uh, he taught me how to do Donald Duck when I was four. Yeah, my parents were very creative, talented people, but they, you know, never pursued any career uh, in the arts. Um, except my mother, when she retired uh, as an accountant from accounting, uh, she decided to become a, a reporter for a newspaper. So, and she just, basically she was just writing. She always wrote stories and speeches and she belonged to a speech club and stuff like that. And then she wrote these, she wrote several of these stories. It was called Coffee with Mary. And uh, she was just basically talking about whatever she wanted to talk about. And they liked her writing so much, they just said, hey, do you want to just be on the staff as a journalist? So she started doing reporting then. Nice. <laughs> and my father, you know, he he could sing, uh, and he did voice impressions and stuff like that. Uh, but his retirement job, he became a park ranger. We don't get, the, we don't get park mm -hmm. rangers here as far as I know, but we do get some kind anyway. Well, you do, have, you do have park rangers in a way, I bet. I mean, your national parks probably have people who preside over them, make sure everybody's safe and everything goes well and that the bears aren't stealing from the picnic basket. <laughs> if only we had bears. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if only. Uh, who's your favorite character to voice right now? Mm. My favorite to voice... <sighs> well, of all time, I'd have to say it was Koro Sensei from Assassination Classroom. Uh, because that that character is just so much like me uh, that it's easy for me to relate to him. Yeah. But uh, my usually my favorite character is whichever one I'm doing now, because um, you know you have to put your your all of yourself into this voice, and and so that means that you're going to relate to him fully. You know. Yeah. Um, I I would say 
I love Usopp. I love Krillin. I love um, Maze Hughes from Full Metal Alchemist. Um, I like this character I'm doing right now. It's a uh, on a uh, Fire Fox or Fire. What is it called? Fire Brigade or Fire Hats or something? It's Fire something. Fire Force. Uh, and in Fire Force, I play a character called Joker, uh, and he's just this evil guy, and it's that was fun to do. Um, what else? What are the favorite things to do? I love playing those psychos in Borderlands 2. I loved playing Splosion Man. Um, I, honestly, it's, it's usually whatever character I'm playing I love the most. Funnily enough, I was playing Borderlands 2 not long ago, and uh, I swore I could hear you screaming stuff at me, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, hold on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, if you go to uh, YouTube, um, Borderlands Psychos, there were two of us who did all the psycho voices. Yeah. And uh, you can hear each one of us on there. They have like a track that's devoted to all the ones I did. And all the ones, it might have been Chris Kaysen. I'm not sure who did the other psychos. Kind of sounds like Kaysen, but I'm not sure. Don't don't quote me on that, internet. Uh, who's the hardest character to voice? Um, well, it used to be President Mike, and it was so hard I had to quit. Uh, President Mike was a great voice. I, I love the voice I did for him. I actually, it's, uh, it's uh, like this. You know, it's very old school DJ with a stuffed up nose, basically. Ah. Uh. Uh, I based it on this guy named uh, Tom Likas in the United States. He had a radio station, and uh, Tom Likas uh, is just the worst misogynistic asshole you could ever listen to. But his voice is really good old radio. And it was a great voice. I loved doing that voice. But the problem was uh, he screamed in season two. Oh. And for some reason, it was, it was just constant screaming. But for some reason, doing this voice and screaming with it no. just... It tore me up, and it's so weird because like Usopp was the most painful voice for me to do, but I could do Usopp for a couple of hours, and if I rest the next day, I'm fine. Yeah. Um, but the character, it gave me laryngitis, and then the laryngitis turned into pneumonia, oh. and then I was like, I gotta really watch myself on this. I mean, I'm, I'm I went to uh, Colleen Clinkenbeard, the director, and at the time, I was directing at Funimation, so I said, well, why don't I just direct myself when I have free moments and that way I can take my time with it and she said yeah anything it takes to get the part right to get, mm. to get that role done and I said okay and I did three lines on my own with that screaming and I was I started feeling the laryngitis come back and I said I never had to do this I have to quit I can't do this part mm. so I, I gave it up and they uh, I think it cast oh it cast Dave Trosco uh, to play him after me but the cool thing is I did it for the first two seasons so people still come up to me at conventions and ask me to sign their posters and stuff like that. Yeah. So I still get credit for them. Uh, and also, you know, I established the voice, you know, that they then did impressions of. But um, it was really heartbreaking for me to give up that role. Not not just because it was a fun role, but also it was a really high Q rating on the show, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and that, you know, this is like it's the next big thing. Mm. Uh, really sucks, especially since I already won the audition, you know. Yeah. But that, that was definitely the hardest voice I've ever had to do. I'm going to be honest, I had no idea you could actually get seriously or physically ill from doing a voice that was too hard. Yeah, you can. I mean, if, if well, especially if you um, live in a place like I do where the pollen count is horrifying and the pollution count is horrifying, and so a lot of people here get respiratory issues pretty easily. Yeah. Um, and so if you get laryngitis, it can le easily lead to something like pneumonia. I, w I was like, you know, I didn't have any limitations before then, you know? And it's like, oh, shit, I've got a limitation. I cannot <laughs> do that voice screaming. Is there any roles you ever regret taking on? No. I'm a, a vocal whore. I'll just take whatever they give me. But I, I, there, was a, there was a part that I played that I, was, I always bring up when people ask that question. And I was just walking in the hallway at Funimation, and um, Chris uh, Bevins said, he's a director up there, where, now he's in L.A., but he said, uh, hey, Sonny, i got a part for you real quick. And I said, okay. And it was a guy buying soiled panties from a soiled panty store. Okay. And I was like, what the hell is that? I didn't even know those existed. Apparently, there it's a thing in Japan. You can actually go to a soiled panty store. And um, then he gets...
sleeps in an alley, you know, it's just horrifying. Wow. And I, I always say the worst thing about that whole experience was it didn't bother me at all. It's just like, ah, okay, there's another 50 bucks, thanks. I walked out. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard parts like that before. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, I don't even know what show it was, honestly, and I never even asked. So I was just like, Ugh. Although we're in a lot of shows that we don't know that we're in because many times you're asked to come in and they don't even tell you what show it is. You just start working. They tell you the scene. They'll tell you about the show. Mm. They'll say this is what's going on and stuff like this. Um, but a lot of times you have no idea. And like, I'll go to conventions and people will ask me to sign stuff and I'll go, you sure I'm in this? And they go, yeah, yeah. And they'll pull up the credits and show me. I went, oh, okay, I guess it was. So <laughs> and then sign it. But uh, unless it's like a really big show like One Piece or Dragon Ball Z or Full Metal Alchemist, a lot of times we have no clue, you yeah. know. So it's like, oh, yeah, I did do that. <laughs> yeah, sometimes not even then. They can even play me my voice and I'll go, well, that's me, but I don't remember doing it. I've never, I've never complained about voice acting. That's a that's a job that I've never been like upset that I have to go to work. Mm. You know, like I've had a lot of shit jobs where I was just like, Ugh, I don't want to go to work. You know, I've never thought that at Funimation. You know, like when I'm, or even in the video games or or any of the commercials I've done, it's always fun. Yeah, you know? it might be a hassle getting there because Dallas is so spread out. You know, yeah. um, that can take you an hour and a half to get to work sometimes. But uh, in traffic, but once you're there, I mean, it's just a, it's a joy. It's a great job. Yeah, I mean, I'm still getting used to knowing I have fans and people say they want to work with me and they want me to do stuff for them. And <laughs> I'm still really getting used to that yeah. because it's very, it feels very strange to me. Well, that's a good thing to be. Um, it's a good place to be, though. It is, yeah. When you get a character to a uh, voice or to audition for. Uh, how do you decide on what you want them to sound like? Uh, I you, well, sometimes it's based on the Japanese version. Like they want us to sound just like the Japanese. Yeah. Uh, but that's rare. Usually, they just want us to be the same type of character that the Japanese is portraying. Um, but what I tend to do is I look at the face of the character and the physique of the character, and I imagine how I would sound if I had that face and physique mm. and sort of just use it as an avatar. Basically, I, I just put on their body as a costume. Mm. And how would I speak through that? And how would my voice sound naturally coming through that? Like, there's a character I play called uh, Andre. His name is Andre, and he's on a show called uh, Prison School. Yeah. And, and, and uh, Prison School is a pretty dirty show, but uh, it's, it's funny. But there's a character named Andre, and his head is giant, right? And he's got this little tiny face inside this giant head, and he's got a, a body that's very heavy set, right? So I figured if you're heavy set and you've got a tiny little mouth like this, you're going to be pushing everything out of esophagus, and it'll be harder to breathe and talk. Yeah. So that's where I came up with his voice. I'm just trying to come up with something natural for that. Although a lot of people accuse me of trying to sound like Smeagol, but that was not my intention. Uh, although it does sound like like Smeagol. I don't know why Smeagol sounds that way. He doesn't look like he would talk that way at all. No. Uh, but uh, it seems to work somehow. Mm. But uh, that's where I usually start with the physicality, and then I look at the history of the character, like, you know, and his region, you know, where they want him to be from, so that, you know, to either give him an accent or not. But at the same time, it, even if he's like the most evil, twisted person with an Australian accent and so much fun for us, you know, I would still try to imagine that that's me and I've lived this guy's life and how would I sound if I lived his life. Have you have you ever gotten so into a voice role you felt exactly how the character was feeling? Yeah, <clears throat> a lot of times. Um, but the most it's ever been that way was with uh, Koro Sensei. Mm. Uh, and I, I totally got him from day one. And it's kind of weird because like a lot of times at Funimation, they don't tell you when you get cast in something. Yeah. Um, and uh, sometimes you don't even have to audition because people know who you are and they know what you know a lot of your repertoire. And they or they go, oh, I really like the way he did that. If he did that with a southern accent because she's from South uh, Japan, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they, uh, Carl Sensei, I was not told that I was casting that. I was just told I had a, a session with Joel McDonald, and I show up for Joel and I said. 
so what what are we doing? More One Piece or something? Because Joel also did One Piece. He goes, oh, no, no, they didn't tell you? And I said, didn't tell me what? He's like, you're the lead in the show. And I went, oh, that would have been some nice information. <laughs> a little research on this and figured it out. But they show we did the first scene, I believe, and after we did the first scene, I was like, oh, I know who this guy is. And Joel had the luxury of going back and re-recording what we had done before so that we could solidify this character. And, you know, by the third episode, I was telling the directors what was going on in the scene. It was like, they're like, I don't know what he's saying here. He's like, well, he's saying this. And I got it, you know. And I, and I just, let me give it a read. Because I, I really got him and I really related to him right away. Yeah. And also, I started teaching... The same week I started voicing Koro Sensei, I started teaching my classes, and it was really weird because as the show would progress, I guess when you teach, there are certain things that have to be covered in any subject, you know, certain things you've got to, steps you've got to go in the process of learning. Yeah. And it would be weird because it would be like, I just talked about that in my class last week, and Koro Sensei is saying the same thing now. Yeah. So it was, it was really cool, and I, and I could... Yeah, you do get to a point, though, with characters, especially the ones that you do for a long time, where you do think like them. Mm. You know, you're, it's easy to create a composite brain for this character that you can think through, you know? And it's... I used to do that in theater all the time, but when I did it in theater, it really felt like this brain that was an object that I was outside of that I could control and drive, Right. Yeah. But a lot of these roles that I've been doing for 10 to 20 years now, um, it's more like I don't even do that. It feels like I am that character yeah. when I do it. It's like I'm living, even though it's like one line at a time, during that one line, I am living that character's life. It's better than any video game you could play. Any character you would currently love to do that you are not doing or you've ever wanted to do? Mm, you know, I, I would love to do like Bugs Bunny or or, or uh, like some of the classic characters, like Popeye. I would love to do Popeye. Mm. Although I kind of do Popeye with Krillin. And I've mentioned this on, on several panels and stuff, but uh, Krillin, originally I, I, was, I had to sound like the, the Canadian uh, actor. Mm. Uh, and it was like, yes, hey everybody, it's me, Krillin! That was the ocean, and, that was the ocean uh, dub, right? Ocean Dub, yeah, it's 21 yeah. years ago. Wow. And um, the director at the time, guy named Barry Watson, good old boy from Texas, you know, had a big old Texas accent. Mm. He said, uh, and he's totally not politically correct, so excuse me, YouTube. <laughs> but he said, he said, well, you know, that sounds just like Terry Clawson, but I hate that voice. And I was like, oh, f he's going to replace me. And I went, um, well, I do other voices. And he goes, oh, I know, I know you did in the audition, but here's the thing. Krillin is a midget. This is the politically incorrect part. Yeah. But he's also the world's strongest human being. And I was like, oh, you want like a tough midget? And he goes, yeah. Well, I had already read the manga by this point. And when you read manga or comics, you have a voice in your head for everybody's the characters that you're reading, right? Mm. But to me, the voice sounded something like Popeye on Helium. So I said, well, how about Popeye on Helium? And he goes, how would that sound? I went, I don't know, something like this? Come on, guys, let's go! And he went, yeah, yeah, use that. That sounds good. So I was able to, to take it in that direction. So I kind of have been doing a little, like a Popeye-esque character, uh, although the character itself is nothing like Popeye. Um, but the voice is similar. Um, but I would love to do that. I, I actually got to do Elmer Fudd. I got to do one line of Elmer Fudd, and it was so cool to say, "Is this official?" And they went, "Yeah, it was a, it was for a video game." And the guy who plays Elmer Fudd now, um, he had already recorded all his lines and couldn't get him back into the studio in time for release, and so they asked me to do one line of Elmer Fudd, and uh, it was so cool. I was like, "I'm actually doing Elmer Fudd." Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you mentioned before about your YouTube channel, but. Uh... Helping you boost your subscriber count. Do you want to tell everybody about it? Well, um, I guess it was a little over a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. Uh, one of my students uh, was showing me some of his little animation projects he did at, at, at uh, the University of North Texas. And uh, 
Josh Martin, the guy who does the voice of Majin Buu, mm -hmm. he also does this uh, character parody character of the Pillsbury Doughboy. He called the Pillsbury Homeboy, <laughs> and he does it rapping and stuff, you know, like uh, the hip hop songs and stuff. And he actually did it, produced a hip hop song using the Pillsbury Doughboy. And uh, he, uh, Hills, Pillsbury Homeboy, got it mixed up. So anyway, so he said, he said, "Do you know anybody who animates?" Because I want to do a little video. And I said, "Yeah, there's a student in my class that does." And so I told uh, the student, his name is Spencer, about it. And then he brought in his friend uh, from school named Gemma, and Gemma is also an animator. Mm. And so they started working on this project. But then I was thinking, you know, I would love to see some of my work animated. So I took a couple of old men that were in a, a comic strip I had called Car Bombs. Yeah. And with these two 90-year-old men who uh, start a, a punk rock band. And um, so... I, I like those two characters. I said, well, let's just animate them, see what happens. And they did this little baseball scene where there's, they're just playing catch. Uh, and it got really twisted and really fun. And we just made it up as we went along. And then I was kind of hooked on the idea of doing animation. So we started working on a full seven-minute cartoon called Level Lad. And you can see all these at Sunny Straight Studios uh, on YouTube. Sunny Straight Studio, S-O-N-N-Y-S-T-R-A-I-T Studios. And um, so that we did Level Lad was a cool seven minute thing, and then I was asked to do uh, ElfQuest, and ElfQuest is a comic book series. I used to work on this, you know, back in two thousand and one, um, and I love com comics. Is my first love. So to be working in comics again, yeah, I was like, yeah, absolutely, but it didn't give me any time to animate, and I wanted to keep this going, and I wanted them to still work on the animations. So I had this idea, why don't we take all these recordings I have of me at comic book convent or and, and, and anime conventions talking on panels, because I tell a lot of stories and they usually last about a minute, you know, and I said, you could just take those and I design my, a character of myself and, then, and a stage that they could be talking to an audience in, right? And then I said, make sure that every character is me. Like me in cosplay, you know. Yeah. That way we don't get in violating co uh, copyright infringement because it's just a cartoon version of me, like with a shaved head with dots on my head or whatever for Krillin or or, or even like Caitlyn Glass. I put on a wig and I look like Caitlyn Glass except for the goatee. Yeah. And I make a horrible, ugly Caitlyn Glass. Caitlyn Glass is very beautiful, but when I cosplay her, it doesn't look good. <laughs> so, uh, so and those are going really well. People seem to really like those. Um, and we also, I also did one where it's called Monster Band Practice. Yes. This one, I just came home one day and my friend Linda and my wife Gayla were on their second bottle of wine. And they, we've all been in bands, you know, the three of us. So uh, I decided to do a, a little experiment with uh, improv. And I recorded them without them knowing it. And I just said, okay, we're going to start a, a, a rock band tonight. So we got to write an album. Okay, sure, whatever. And they just went rolled right into it. And then it sounded like some band practice, like we're just coming up with ideas and stuff like that. And then I, uh, I got like enough. I st we still haven't gone through all these recordings yet. And and we do them like every other week. And we're doing almost a year now. And and I still we haven't done half of them. But they were just these little one minute increments of them uh, talking about the next song or what they want to do with this song. And they're all really funny and stuff. And so. Um, I took him to Gemma and I said, here, I want you to listen to these voices and I want you to create monsters for those voices. And she came up with all these cool monster designs and then I took her designs and I streamlined them to make them more commercial looking, uh, more like Hanna-Barbera type characters. Mm. And then um, she takes those puppets and she animates them and creates all kinds of crazy stuff every week with them. And then I've got, like, Spencer. Uh, Spencer's now working in another studio most of the time, but uh, Spencer's a great uh, musician. And what I would do is I would say things like, hey, make it sound like they're just coming at the end of a song and they're just finished practicing something and now they're just talking about something else. Or maybe while they're, they're talking about something, somebody is, like, tuning a guitar or stuff like that. And so it really does sound like any band practice that you could just drop in on, you know, just people talking crap. Yeah. Or in between songs, 
Um, but that's it. That's Sunny Street Studios. Check it out. It's, it's uh, they're all very fun and also very informative, like especially the Sunny Tunes because that's me talking about the industry of anime. Mm. A lot of things that we actually talked about in this interview were actually already animated. You teach voice acting as well uh, in your studio. Yeah. Um, what what made you want to teach? Uh, I had a I don't want to go too much into, it, but I had a family member that was having some real uh, problems that required a lot of money to get him out of this hole. Mm. And so, and I, I you don't make a lot of money as a voice actor. You know, mm. it's it's kind of hard to make a living at it. Uh, you can do okay, right? But to get some kind of real money to actually help somebody get out, that was really tough. And I was like, well, what can I do that I can actually that I like to do? Because I don't want to do any work that I don't want to do. Mm. Um, that's been my goal. But I, I've always loved teaching, and my original goal was to be a theater professor. I was it was went to school for. Um, but then I dropped out of school as soon as I got my first story published in a comic book. Uh, so I decided. So I, I never went back to school, so that dream kind of fell through. But I thought, you know what, I, I would love to get back into teaching. And, I, and so I thought, um, maybe I could start teaching these classes. And it was really a good boon to my income as well. And it was like an instant success. And I was able to help out that family member and, and get them on their, on their way. But in the meantime, I've got this great little thing that, that's another part of my career now, you know, yeah. is teaching. And I started off teaching in... Uh, dance studios and art art studios and stuff like that. Um, and my friend Neil, who I've known before Funimation, we but he's now one of the he uh, head engineers at Funimation. Mm. Uh, he would bring a portable recording setup with a microphone stand and everything. And then the the, 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 the students would come in and we'd teach them and record everything. And since we're recording so much of their voice, I said, why don't we take what those recordings and turn them into demos? Mm. And so he would mix them, and and we would come up with demos, and they, they weren't the they were good quality, but they were not the best quality because we're recording in a dance hall. That there's a lot of you know we would try to put pads and stuff around us to make sure it sounded as muffled as possible, but it still was not the best quality. But that being said, a lot of my students got work in the anime and voice acting industry based on those demos. Wow. Well, then um, Chuck, I mean Chris, Chris Rager was uh, at my studio once and he was complaining about not ever having money. I said, well, dude, you should do what I do. You should teach. You know, there's a lot of money in teaching. And he goes, how do you do that? And I said, just get an engineer and start up. So next thing I know, he's teaching at Okatron 5000, which is Chris Sabat's studio. Wow. And so, and so I said, hey, I told you to teach. I didn't tell you to do it better than me. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I better step up my game. So I looked around town to see if I could find a studio space I could afford, and I found this really great old building. It looks I've loved this building since I moved here to go to school uh, in 1988, um, and it's I call it a Frank Lloyd Wrong building because it's it looks kind of like Frank Lloyd Wright, but just some it's a little off, but it has the flat roofs and everything. Hmm. And and I, and I and again I, I just said, well, I probably won't be able to afford it because it's such a beautiful place. And it turned out no, it was like well within my budget. And so I moved in here, and I, I've got about 900 square feet. And I took two of the small offices and broke down the wall between them and uh, built a stage in there. So now we have a stage room that the students can actually get in front of their, uh, their peers and perform monologues and things like that. Because a lot of people who want to get into this industry have no acting training at all. Right. Yeah. So I know how important it is to get on the stage and get a sense of timing because you're, you're the audience reacting to you and stuff like that. So uh, I thought, well, I, I got to make it as theatrical as possible for them. Mm -hmm. So the first two days, I usually do weekend workshops now. The first two days are solely focused on acting and performing in front of the audience. And then the third day, we spend all day recording. And then I take the recording from that and uh, turn it into a demo. I used to record every day, but I found now if I give the first two days to teach them the basics of acting and motivation, that by the time the third day rolls around, the reads are so much better than if I do it from the very beginning. So I focus on acting on that, and then I have an advanced course, which is just acting. 
Hmm. And if you take the advanced, the advanced course is mostly uh, improv, um, get, but that is so important to be in the moment because a lot of, of movies and television shows require improv skills more than anything else. Like the movie Thor Ragnarok, I found out later, I was like, I watched that show and I was like, man, the script is weak, but the actors are selling this. It's amazing. It sounds so natural, um, what they're saying. And then I found out later, that was all improvised. You know, they, they had a script and then they were told, okay, now improvise the scene. So the reason the script wasn't as solid is because these are, this is the way people speak. You know, this is their the actor's own natural voice coming out, which made it more believable. Uh, but what was missing is the poetry of a writer's script. Yeah. You know, writers write more poetically than most people speak, right? So w with Ragnarok, you've got a, a really interesting experiment in that it was just all improvised. Mm -hmm. And a lot of comedies are done that way. It, it worked with Ragnarok, too, because it was more of a comedy. So also, all these reality shows, I found out, like, at a convention years ago, uh, another voice actor came up to me and said, yeah, I, I just got on Gene Simmons' uh, reality show. I went, oh, cool, is he doing a reality show about voice acting or something? And he goes, no, 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 I play a, an investor in his company. And I went, what do you mean you play an investor? It's a reality show. And he goes, oh, <laughs> you don't know what a reality show is. A reality show is not reality. A reality show is the plot is scripted and the rest is improvised. And I was like, oh, okay. So I was like, this is very important for, improvisation is very important for uh, actors now. And also it's important because when you're recording in a booth even, um, a lot of times the script doesn't fit the mouth flaps properly. Mm -hmm. And so the director usually has to sit down, stop production and figure out a way to make it fit the flaps. But if you're good at improvising, you can improvise to that rhythm. You see the rhythm on the screen and you just come up with something that fits that rhythm, right? Yeah. Um, and so uh, so I, I really focus heavily on improvising, but also just being able to be totally in the moment. That's really hard for young actors to do, so they need a lot of improvisation to make them in that moment. Mm. Uh, because your, your performance is going to be so much more believable if you're, if you're there, you know, if you're present. Yeah. If you're relying on your skill level and stuff like that, you can give a, a a believable performance, but if you really want the audience to feel it, then you have to be in that moment, living that character. Yeah. And so the exercise I do teach you teach you how to do that. Um, and then after you take the advanced course, you uh, can qualify to take another class that I only let professionals take or people who have had my advanced class, and it's a called a lead role class. And that one, I usually get a professional voice actor uh, director to come in and um, they'll direct you and like four other students. That's all, it's limited to five people. Um, and you get 12 hours of recording time as if you have the lead in a show. And they direct you that way. Hmm. And uh, it is really good training. It's, it's, I call it batting practice for voice actors. Um, because I've noticed like a lot of people like from my class they'll get in at Funimation and then it'll take them like a year or so to get their footing yeah. at, at uh, Funimation or any other place and, I, and I'm like well, well what changed for you and he said well I just got a role that was big enough that I could get enough practice in and I went oh so there's a need for practicing on the boy on the on the mic so I, that's what the class is set up for so they can just take time you know and and be treated as if they have a lead in an anime. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's great training. People really love it. The head of engineering at Funimation, his name is Nathaniel Harrison. And Nathaniel uh, is wanting to teach a class on uh, recording, like uh, how, to, how to record on Pro Tools and all these other programs people have now. He said that his class, what he wants to do is whatever it is you're recording on, he wants to show you how to make it sound better. And so apparently, a, a lot of voice actors have already lined up to take his class, and we haven't even set it up yet. But they're because a lot of times these days, people want you to record from home. Mm. And a lot of times, what you record from home is not audition. A lot of times, that's what they're going to use for the final product. So 
you want to be able to produce the best sound you can from your house. I was talking to Kara Edwards about this the other day. She uh, does a lot of books on, uh, uh, not books on tape, that's, that's a really old statement, uh, audio books. She does a lot of audio books. Um, but, uh, but she has, does it from her house. She's got, a, she's got a booth set up there, and she does all the recording there. So you know, learning about compression and things like that is very useful for somebody who's in her shoes because she can make the bulk of her living not leave the house. Yeah. So that's, that's and you can find that. I use the same name, but if you go to SunnyStraightStudios.com, a lot of students have come in from England and Australia and New Zealand, and every state in the United States has come by, except Hawaii. I haven't had anybody from Hawaii yet. I, mean, I did have somebody from Alaska once, but uh, but most but but it's the reason why it's uh, because it's set on the weekend. You know, it's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, so people can travel and get it all done in the weekend. For a while, I was doing it once a week, like for six weeks. Like we'd meet one day for a few, for a couple hours, uh, and then we'd meet the next week and the next week and the next week. And then I found out a lot of my students were flying in from other states to do this. And I was like, "You're flying in every week for a couple of hours?" And they're like, "Yeah." And I went, "You know what? From now on, it's going to be on the weekend. That way, you guys can fly out, get it all done in the same weekend, uh, in 12 hours over the weekend." And then I found people are coming now coming in from other countries because they, they can make that work. And since I do the classes, you know, every other month I do that basic class, um, you can save up for it. Like a lot of people will say, well, I'll be there next year. And sure enough, they arrive next year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're never for a want of students. And also, there's a lot of people now teaching. When I was doing it, I was the only one when I started. But now, like especially like Rager's class, he gets a lot of people and he'll recommend people to take my classes and I'll tell them to take his classes because there's not really a school for this you know yeah. so we're kind of like a a floating university and um, and I highly recommend taking Chris Rager's classes too yeah. um, his is different like my class I tend to be like one teacher for the whole weekend and we focus on developing you through that weekend mm -hmm. um, his classes are more like um, he gets like several voice actors to teach for an hour, mm. right? So you get to hear a lot of different people's approaches to voice acting. Both are very valuable, and, and I, I and also you're talking about Chuck Huber. Uh, Chuck has taught at my school. He also teaches stuff online. I highly recommend his classes. He's a great teacher. Yeah. Um, Caitlin Glass occasionally teaches. She's a great teacher as well as I. Somebody said Caitlin was teaching, and I said. Wherever the line is, whatever the amount is, take the class. Caitlin Class is one of the greatest actors I've ever directed. So if she's teaching a class, you want to know what she has to say. Um, I think that wraps the interview up. That's all the questions I've got here anyway. But <laughs> but that's no, that's, that's that's everything, yeah. But no, we've delved in a very big conversation there. That's really okay. really wonderful. Well then I I would say I will just give an conclusion. I'll give an in conclusion. Okay. In conclusion, go to my YouTube site, Sunny Straight Studios. Go to my website, SunnyStraightStudios.com. If you want to take my classes, check out my new series, Elf Quest, that I'm drawing uh, for Dark Horse Comics. Uh, you can order it now this month, and it comes out in November. Uh, this is a great series. I worked on the. This is a 40-year-old series. If you've never heard of Elf Quest, it's over 40 years old now, and. I drew it back in 2001, and now I'm working very closely with Wendy Peeney on the new series. Um, I convinced her. She didn't want to draw anymore, but I kind of twisted her arm into doing at least rough layouts. So she's doing rough layouts for the pages. I'm doing finished drawings over top of her layouts and coloring it and putting out, and it is just tremendous. It is the most beautiful thing I've ever been a part of. Uh, the artwork and the story is just haunting. And I know you guys will love it if you read it. It's, she is one of the first um, anime-influenced artists in this country, maybe the first, actually. Um, she, was, she was drawn in 1979. Back then, nobody knew what a manga or a manga was, um, but she did because uh, she went to a little uh, area that was um, a Japanese colony near her house, and she would go in there and buy all the Japanese books. It was all in another language. She couldn't read it, but it was a huge influence on her drawing style. And you can see it in the work, especially with the way the elves themselves are drawn. Mm. So anyway, so those are the main things. Check out Elf Quest. 
uh, my Sunny Stray Studios dot com, Sunny Stray Studios on YouTube, and uh, you follow me on Twitter at Sunny Straight. Um, follow me on Instagram, but I don't really talk very much on that. Uh, and uh, I guess that's it. All of those, if I can fit them all in, will all be in the link in the description. So yeah, if you want to check them out, they're all right there. So thank you very Yay. much for taking the time to talk with me, and I wish you luck on your future projects. Thanks. Look at the camera. <laughs> bye bye.